So welcome to today's Heriot Watt Graduate Apprenticeships webinar. Today we're looking at uh, our civil engineering programme along with um, Alina Rinaldi from, who's the Academics Partnership Manager from the Institution of Civil Engineers, who will professional development provided by the Institute of Civil Engineers. Laurent, who is our Programme Director for the Civil Engineering GA programme, will give us an overview of the programme and graduate apprenticeships. And Laurent, I'm going to hand over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. So my name is Laurent Garbin. I am the Programme Director for the Graduate Apprenticeship in Civil Engineering. And I just want to give you an overview of uh, the programme we offer. I'll start by discussing entry requirements, give an overview of the programme, uh, its content and structure, what is work-based learning, which is the very important bit. What is the role of a work-based mentor? And I'll also quickly mention accreditation with routes to incorporate engineer and chartered engineer. So first of all, the degree we offer in civil engineering uh, has an excellent reputation and has been ongoing for a long time. We are ranked top 10 in the UK in the Guardian University Guide of 2020, and we are ranked in the world's top 150 for civil engineer and structural engineering in the QS World University Rankings by subject from 2017. So a well-established reputation and well-known for good quality degrees. Now, entry requirements. So here are listed some of our entry requirements for year one or advanced entry, which means effectively year two or even year three entry. Now we list here some qualifications. So for example, the Scottish hires where you have three for one A and four Bs. If you wanted to enter in year one or A levels at A, B, C or B, B, B. So there are these qualifications, but it's very important to remember that an apprenticeship looks also at recognized prior experiential learning. So you might have quite a bit of experience at work and that would be obviously taken into account. So it's not only about the academic qualifications, we look at a case by case and we make a judgment on whether you qualify uh, to start the apprenticeship. For advanced entries, you will need to have slightly higher marks if it's, you know, from your marks from school or you might have done an HNC in civil engineering or an HND. Uh, and again, there might be cases where you have a lot of uh, professional experience, which uh, means you qualify to actually start from year two, potentially even year three in some exceptional cases. But the thing to remember, don't look simply at these qualifications listed here. We will look at the overall picture and make a judgment on whether you can uh, start the apprenticeship with us. In terms of the general information about the programme, the whole, whole point of being an apprenticeship is really to be exposed to a wide range of uh, disciplines. So we really want to produce high quality graduates with the understanding, knowledge, skills and personal qualities required to undertake a wide range of construction. So imagine you are working in a company and you have been working mainly in one area. If you are uh, starting the apprenticeship, you would be expected to be exposed to a wider range of areas. So you would look at a number of subjects that are related to your degree. So the subjects we cover are structures, geotechnics, materials, hydraulics and hydrology. We have some math courses. All those things should be aligned really with what you do at work. So you should find some uh, work-based experience that can be aligned to your degree. We obviously also include within the degree environmental aspects, sustainability, management. You will see when I show the structure, there are a number of management subjects, uh, effectively quantity surveying subjects, which are taken from another graduate apprenticeship we offer at Harriet Watt University. You would be doing some problem solving, design, analysis. There will be courses where you work in uh, groups, so you learn about teamwork, you will develop your writing skills as well as your professional skills. So it's a mix of theory and practice during the degree, and a large portion will be uh, reports that you submit that are based on work-based evidence, so these are called work-based portfolios, but you will also have, you know, the traditional type of assessment like on-campus students. So you will do some coursework and you will have some exams as well. Now, here is the structure of the degree. These are the first two years. 
And I just want to spend a little bit of time explaining how this all works. So what you see on top for year one, you have courses in semester one, you have courses in semester two. There are normally no courses delivered in semester three. We normally do not teach during semester three. But these courses you see in semester one and semester two are identical to what on-campus students do, which means that you would come or you would have one university day in which you do those courses. For example, in semester one, uh, you would be doing in year one, Shaping Tomorrow Together A and the Maths for Civil Engineering. OK, and you would do some coursework, you would have some exams for some courses, but you would have no work-based component for such courses. So the semester one, semester two uh, courses effectively are identical to what on-campus students do, while what you see under that are four other courses, which are what we call the work-based learning courses. So these ones, you do not attend lectures. Instead, you have to write a work-based portfolio so you need to meet the learning outcomes still of the course, but by providing some work-based evidence. And I'll discuss in a moment what I mean exactly by work-based evidence and how these things actually work. But effectively, that means that those courses can be carried out across the academic year. <clears throat> it's not limited to one semester. There is flexibility because you can decide in which order you do those courses. You might be working on a project uh, when you start the degree that might be relevant to one, very relevant to one of the subjects. So you decide to start by that course and then move on to another one. That's totally fine. It's up to you how you organize yourself. If we look at year two, uh, there is one slight difference, which is one course that is taught in semester three. And the reason for that is that from this year, we're offering two points of entry. So traditionally, an apprentice would start in September and would follow uh, the academic year, which is uh, September to August. So in that traditional uh, academic year, semester one would be September to December, semester two is January to April, semester three is May to August. This year, in addition to uh, a September start, we also offer a January start. So you can decide to start the apprenticeship in January. Now, as a consequence, for example, in year two, we had to move one of the math courses to semester three, because you need to do that in the correct order. You have first math for engineers and scientists one, which needs to precede math for engineers and scientists two, which is why we have put those things now in semester two and semester three respectively, as opposed to semester one and semester two as they used to be, because we couldn't have a generally start having math two uh, before having done math one. So that's the justification behind this slide. Uh, change in the structure, but otherwise the structure remains identical, whether you are a September, st September start or a January start. Uh, in practice, you do the same courses, September start you do September to August, while January start you do January to December. Okay, so you have just a slight different order in which you do things, but you do exactly the same courses. Uh, these are the courses for year three and year four. I just want to point out that the courses that are done on campus, uh, so, so for example, year three, structural analysis, design of steel elements, design of concrete elements, hydraulics and geology B, they tend to be the more theoretical courses. So they are the ones that were a bit more difficult to achieve in the workplace because you have quite a bit of hand calculations, for example, and we adapted actually since this year the structure to have all those courses moved to uh, effectively on campus courses, and that's following some feedback from previous years. So that's the reasoning behind uh, the things that are offered either on campus or through work based learning. Uh, in terms of details of those courses, I'm not going to discuss them here. Uh, please do request our handbook. Uh, in the handbook, there are details of each of the courses. There is a summary and there are more details given in what we call the course specification documents. So if needed, you can get access to all those documents and have a good idea of what is covered uh, for all the different courses. The only other thing I would point out is that in year four, you have some slightly different courses such as a dissertation, which is a, a research project and it's a double course. 
it's listed here as 30 credits. Normally courses are only 15 credits. That's equivalent to having two courses. And so you choose one project that you work through across the year. We also have a design project that is not content based. You actually use uh, the knowledge you have learned from other courses and you apply it to a specific design. Now, I was mentioning course specification documents. These are the documents uh, that are key for each of the work based learning courses. So each of the four work based learning courses you do uh, in a year have a document like this one. And effectively, what is listed in those documents, we have two examples here from year one. We have surveying and monitoring on the left. Uh, we have a list of the learning outcomes that are listed. OK, so we have land surveying, for example, for surveying and monitoring with a number of bullet points, measurement and monitoring, and use of information technology. On the right, we have construction technology one, still for year one, with a number of topics, design, uh, mass and mortars, floor construction, wall construction, new values, calculations, roof construction and finishes, sustainable forms of construction. So all the things you need to learn are listed here. And what is very important to understand is that when you submit your work based report, you need to be able to demonstrate an understanding of all, all those things that are listed here. It's not about demonstrating activity only, it's about demonstrating understanding. Now, what's the difference? You might be thinking, oh, I am doing those things at work. I will provide some documents that show that I do those things, some drawings, some spreadsheets with calculations. Yes, that's all fine, but but it's very important to have the narrative that demonstrates you can explain what the topics are, you can critically discuss design decisions, or why you do certain things in a certain way. So all those elements are what will demonstrate your understanding and they need to be part of the submission. So how do you achieve this work-based learning? You have one day per week at Harriet Watt University, while you have four days in the office with your employer. Now, it's important to stress that we're talking about a full-time degree. You are not actually coming one day a week at university and doing all the university work in that day. This is not the model. Instead, the four days you are in the office, you are using your knowledge to actually uh, help you write those work-based portfolios. So you are continu continuously engaged with learning and with using your knowledge for the degree. So effectively, if you start in year one, you will get a degree from Harriet Watt University after four years, like a full time on campus student. OK, this is not a part time degree. Now, as a consequence, it is obviously quite challenging, but very rewarding because you do work, you get the experience and you get the degree uh, after the same amount of time of an on campus student. But to be able to achieve that, you need to work hard. And that's why we have now put in contract that of the four days you are with your employer, half a day should be specifically dedicated to university work. And by university work, we mean, you know, you might need some time to do a bit of reading or writing of the reports. The half a day is indicative. It could be an hour here and there within the week. It could be a full day over two weeks. You can decide that, you can organize yourself uh, this is not really for us to decide, uh, for the academics to decide. It's a decision you make with your employer. We will have regular meetings between the personal tutor, so the academic. I act as personal tutor for quite a number of the apprentices. Uh, the apprentice and the work-based mentor, so three people, will have regular meetings to formally check, you know, what you need to do for your university work, but also check your progress. And at the, in the very first meeting we'll have, we'll also discuss an individual learning agreement that basically is a document where you discuss what are your career objectives. And this is quite important because it can be used to align the activities of what you do at work with meeting those career objectives. Just a little bit more about the portfolio submission, so the courses you do through uh, work-based learning. So the portfolio will address specification document, okay, which I showed two examples just before. So you need to make sure you meet those learning outcomes. Now every apprentice is going to be different, so every portfolio will be different. You know, everybody, uh, all apprentices do different things in the workplace, 
but it's important to keep the portfolio structured around the topics that are given in the course specification document. We do have some submission guidance. Uh, we do run some sessions where we explain in detail what is expected, what is the format, uh, and basically how to write those portfolios. And you should be uh, developing such things throughout the year. You should have uh, meetings, regular meetings with your workplace man managers, sorry, to review progress. Uh, and in that way, you can develop properly a good portfolio. It's very important to remember that as I said before, it's not going to be just providing evidence of activity, but it's also explaining what you do. So every portfolio will always have a main narrative and will have some supporting evidence. So you need to be able to show your understanding of topics, to give a bit of background, to discuss theory, and then to show how you apply that theory to what you do in the workplace. The evidence, the work-based evidence can take many forms. Uh, drawings, reports, project briefs, meeting minutes, photographs, videos, even correspondence where you might be explaining some uh, decisions can actually give us an insight into the process of how you do things. Record of training courses and CPD, company policy documents, procedures, a work diary, which we recommend to keep. Basically, there is not one way uh, or one type of evidence. There are many types of evidence and there might be others that are not even listed here that might be appropriate. The important bit is that your report should always interact with the evidence. So it's not providing the evidence in isolation. It's clearly explaining uh, how that relates to the topics you're discussing. And I just want to finish with a couple of slides about the role of the work-based mentor because every apprentice will have a work-based mentor that uh, is associated to him or her. And the role of the mentor will be to oversee the work-based learning. So make sure that basically the apprentice can meet the learning outcomes. Uh, and to do that, the mentor will need to have some company experience as well as some technical knowledge. The mentor doesn't need to be the line manager. In fact, we have had some mentors that are quite junior, but are very good because they actually are working very closely with the apprentice and they have enough experience to still know what they need to do to meet those learning outcomes. One aspect that is key is that the work-based mentor will need to identify tasks to meet the learning outcomes and that means being able to decide what type of work the apprentice needs to do, uh, maybe they need to be moved across different departments within the company and the mentor will need to have that knowledge to know how this can be achieved. Another point to, to make is that a single task can cover multiple outcomes. And when we're talking about work-based evidence, it's not simply something the apprentice is doing at the time or within that year of uh, the degree. It's any knowledge within the company. So past projects can be used and can be uh, provided as evidence. It's uh, knowledge from colleagues. It's not only the apprentice knowledge, because it would be unreasonable to assume that the apprentice could actually meet all those learning outcomes and do all those work experiences on their own. Now, the work-based mentor needs to be uh, fully engaged in this process, so should read the course specification documents, have regular meetings with the apprentice and monitor uh, their progress, should read the submissions and give some feedback in all the submissions, we have some signatures that are needed from not only the apprentice, but also the work-based mentor, and that's to guarantee that they are happy with the quality of the submission and also that the, the evidence provided is genuine. So it's very much a quality check from the work-based mentor. The work-based mentor will also need to allocate some time for university work, what I previously mentioned as the half a day per week of the four days that uh, are in the company and we need to liaise with the personal tutor at university if any problems arise. So to, to summarize really, the work of needs to be proactive for this to work properly. Another thing just I didn't mention is, so the one day a week that uh, the apprentice does university work is currently a Friday for year one and year two, and it's a Monday for year three and year four. Under the current situation with the pandemic, 
we've effectively been delivering uh, online learning, so recorded lectures, live online uh, Q&A sessions, tutorial sessions, but effectively all the material is available online. And a consequence of that is that we are now offering some distance learning effectively, so there is no need to come to the Edinburgh campus to be able to enrol on the apprenticeship for civil engineering. There will be an expectation in year three uh, to come for a few days to Harriet Watt and to do some lab activities and other things. Uh, so, but that, that's a short amount of time. Effectively, all the material is now available online. Uh, the degree can be studied remotely. My last point is about accreditation. So the program is accredited board of moderators, JBM, for incorporated engineer status. What that means is that if you complete the degree, you will have the educational base for incorporated engineer. Now, obviously, you need to then have your professional experience on top of that. Uh, if you want to progress to chartered engineer status, you might need to do a technical master uh, after the completion of the BEng, or there are also other alternatives that can be done uh, through ICE and Elena Rinaldi with speak probably about can speak about that uh, right now. Okay, but obviously the graduate apprenticeship will encourage awareness of the profession and the development of professional competencies. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just point out here the website uh, hw.ac.uk slash GA. You can find more information there and for applications please do write to the email ga at hw.ac.uk. Thank you. I will now pass on to Elena Rinaldi. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very useful presentation. And let me uh, follow and pick up in many ways uh, where you left it. Can you hear me? Can you hear my... Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, so what I want to tell you about today is uh, precisely what follows from what's been described uh, in the way that all the work that uh, uh, the students are going to do at work uh, is going to be uh, done or can be done and assessed in line with the uh, requirements of the Institution of Civil Engineers, capitalizing on the fact very much that the course is accredited, just as it was said before by the institution. That means that the students undertaking the course will have that box ticked and we will explain it to you in a little while. Why do we want students uh, to hear all that? Because if Harriet Watt very nicely has described what happens at the university in terms of quality and in terms of academic qualification, the institution is here to then take the ball along, if you like, for what then becomes a full professional life. And the apprenticeship programs has the advantage, of course, of making sure that the students do uh, can do can develop the academic knowledge as well as their professional experience in parallel. So it's a great advantage. Um, we want them to uh, have that because we hope that this will lead to a very rewarding career in civil engineering, just as the slide says. Uh, we, um, as the institution of civil engineers, we welcome people from any uh, part of the world, any country. We hear that your your course is the distant learning course. We welcome uh, that is not an issue. The UK was the institution of civil engineers uh, certainly was founded in the UK, but it has uh, 90, over ninety thousand members worldwide, um, and has uh, uh, capabilities to uh, uh, assist. Uh, its members anywhere in the world and it's very much a passport of international competence, international passport of competence. Uh, it will help you progress your career and it will make it uh, uh, visible. So if I'm talking to an employer, it's certainly a very welcome passport or competence that you can use with your clients if your employees uh, uh, have it. The institution, of course, supports your career, um, and this is what uh, we're going to uh, talk about in a moment. What professional qualification we can give, there are a number of them, and the course we've just heard uh, targets incorporated engineer. 
Annette is excellent and will tell you a little bit about uh, how that can be achieved. Uh, obviously, qualification, professional qualification, uh, bring uh, increased status, greater career prospect, uh, and uh, it is proven that they help you earn more money and they are certainly a passport for global opportunities. So we very much encourage any employer to uh, uh, make sure that their uh, employees follow this path and we will support any students who might be listening to us in doing that. So what are we talking about? We're talking about achieving the academic qualification at Harriet Watt, just in the way that you are hearing. But while you achieve those qualifications, you're also earning work experience. And this is the bit where we come in place. You've heard a lot about talk about work-based mentors. Those work-based mentors in an IC system are trained by the institution and are capable of assessing the amount of work that is done uh, on the basis of the criteria of the institution and guide you and do a gap analysis of what you need and what how you need to redirect your uh, experience so that there are no gaps. The uh, assessment is broad and it's based on nine uh, attributes that uh, go from more hard engineering to soft skills, very much common sense, and it complements precisely what you've heard happening at the university. So that at some when that a point is completed and your apprenticeship is completed, uh, uh, the student can sit a professional review uh, and which has very much the look of that picture at the moment is actually online and there's probably that option is going to stay. So, um, uh, well, they will be students at once they complete the a certain amount of uh, learning in the academic institution such as Eriot Watt and a certain amount of work experience signed off by the work-based mentor, which in IC terms we call mentor or a IC mentor or SCE, uh, the student can sit a professional review and uh, bring that portfolio so carefully built and so structured during those years to fruition by uh, showing it to two um, senior people in the field the IC reviewers, and they will tell us all about, uh, and they will go, uh, ask prompting question and open question and hear all about what the student has done, all underpinned by continuing professional development. So what we're here to say today is that students at Harriet Watt enrolled in this apprentice scheme should join as student members. It's free and it entails a whole support by this institution with over 90,000 members, which is a, a learning hub, it has plenty of online resources to complement all of you heard, rewards, the local events, and it will, we don't only suggest that students join the level of the, while they're studying at Harriet Watt, but that this institution will actually stay with the, um, uh, with, with, with the, with the uh, potential civil engineers all throughout the career. Um, we'll provide you with industry at late and it it's a good network. It has a benevolent fund and uh, and it will continue actually to have mentoring capabilities throughout their professional career. So we want this to be the institution of choice of anyone undertaking that apprenticeship. Now, if I may uh, do so, I would launch into a video that will describe a little bit more the qualification. ICE is the world's leading civil engineering institution. If you study civil engineering or a related course, did you know that you can join ICE and it's free? As a student, you have started on the route towards having an exceptionally rewarding career. Civil engineers really do transform lives. You can work in areas such as clean water and sanitation, flood defences and renewable energy. Take a look at the What is Civil Engineering area of our website to find out more about the areas you could work in to transform lives. So how can the Institution of Civil Engineers support you? We are committed to helping our members make a real positive difference to society and the world around them. ICE supports members throughout their career, which starts when you're a student. 
you'll become part of our global community. You can access a wealth of knowledge, content and resources, and we'll support you as you work towards your professional qualifications at Engineering Technician, Incorporated and Chartered Engineer levels. IC will help you to develop as a civil engineer and to have a successful career. Achieving your professional qualification takes a bit of work and a bit of time, but it's really straightforward. It comes from a combination of academic qualifications, professional work experience, and then from passing a professional review. Gaining the experience for EngTech MICA takes two or three years, for ING MICA three or four, and for CENG MICA four or five years. But it isn't really about the length of time that you've been working, it's about the quality of that professional experience. We call this your initial professional development, and as you progress through your career, you'll be recording your IPD and planning and recording your CPD, that's continuing professional development, and you can do that when you're a student as well. After you've completed your qualifications and professional experience at the appropriate level, you can apply for your professional review. That's basically a presentation and interview with two experienced civil engineers or technicians, depending on the grade you're going for. So, what else do you get with your free student membership? Well, you have access to our IC Learning Hub, which is a free online learning portal. There's access to many online resources via our website, including knowledge events and lectures, which are a great chance to learn about the industry and to start to build your network of professional connections. This may help you with job searches in the future. Many student members will meet their future employers through the ICE. You will also have access to our Benevolent Fund, which offers many services, including wellbeing support, and to our mentor matching platform, where you can link with a mentor who could help support your professional development progress. When you graduate, don't forget to transfer to IC Graduate Membership to continue to have access to all the member benefits. ICA has local teams and volunteer representatives around the world. They can deal with membership queries and they arrange professional qualification guidance and knowledge events. There are lots of opportunities to access support and to get involved as part of your ICA global community. Why not become an ICA volunteer? You can find details of your local ICA contacts and events on our website. Go to ICA.org.uk slash near you. And to find contacts for membership and professional qualification support, you can go to the same link or visit ICA.org.uk slash membership to find details of our UK based membership support centre. So, have you joined yet? You can apply online using a mobile, tablet or computer at ICA.org.uk slash students. I've talked to you about what civil engineers do, why it's such a great career choice and how IC can support you during your studies and throughout your career. It's totally free to join as a student member. So join today and make the most of your free membership, access to the global community of civil engineers and support from ICE in your route towards professional qualification. ICE.org.uk slash students.